Hello and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Laura Sebastian Coleman, the Vice President of Data Governance and Quality at Prudential. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is my career in data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And today we are joined by Laura Sebastian Coleman, the Vice President of Data Governance and Quality at Prudential, and dare I say, one of the leading experts in data quality. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Laura, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. So I understand this is a recent promotion uh, to Vice President of Data Governance and Quality. Congratulations, very excited for you. So do you know yet what that means and what you do and what your job is entails? Yeah, so it is recently, recent, just in the past couple of weeks actually that this took place. I've been at Prudential since September of 2021 and uh, just got the news at the beginning of December of 2022. I'm in the same uh, team that I was in, so it's truly a, a move up within the team. We're trying to implement data management, so a range of activities around ensuring that data movement is governed, is managed and known, that we've cataloged our data and can, um, you share business metadata with key stakeholders so they can use the data better and then improving quality. So I've been with with the team trying to work focused mainly on quality improvement. Um, and now my responsibilities will also include uh, data management widely and data governance in particular. So we're looking at um, making sure that we can respond to policies and regulations and also that we can implement data governance policies that will really change the behaviors of, of people at Prudential around their data. So, so just big in task. case, <laughs> and just in case any somebody doesn't know um, who is Prudential and what's the company. Yeah, so Prudential is a 150-year-old company. Uh, it has uh, it started out as purely an insurance company, and now it really is expanded into a range of uh, financial services. Uh, mm -hmm. We we help people manage retirement income. We have a group insurance business that works with uh, employers to ensure that uh, their employees have a wide range of benefits. We do a lot. Um, with financial advisors and try to improve um, financial education so that people uh, can do better with their finances and really so that they can, um, you know, be kind of future thinking with their finances. Uh, Prudential is really about um, what they call financial health. So just as you have physical health and mental health, um, thinking about your finances as a, a way of being healthy and, and uh, taking care of yourself is the, the way that Prudential has uh, tried, to, tried to take it. Because finances, as we all know, can be very stressful to people. But if you have the tools, if you have the education, and if you have the help, then you can be successful uh, with it. So that's, it's, um, a wonderful company. I've really enjoyed being there and in part because they do a lot of good for people and they're really working to expand markets and and uh, you know serve um, populations that haven't previously 
had the opportunity to really think about their finances in the, in the way that we're trying to help them think about them. I like it. I love that approach. And, you know, and certainly being insurance involved in insurance and in finance, I'm guessing there's a lot of regulatory um, uh, rules and processes um, that govern, you know, your data, right, that you have to adhere to. Um, yeah. So how much of your job is is complying with those regulations and how much do you, I mean, and, and do you apply data governance beyond that? It, it, yeah, that, as is the case with many organizations, uh, regulatory requirements are a big part of uh, what we have to manage at Prudential. And because Prudential already has a very strong culture of risk management, um, there are folks in place already who have put a lot of uh, very useful controls around data privacy and uh, and um, other aspects of, of uh, data security and other aspects of data management, sort of that hardcore part of like making sure nothing terrible happens to your data. A big part of what we're now focusing on within, within data governance is supporting um, the effort of Prudential to really be more customer focused and um, and expand its business or look at its business through a different lens. So um, Prudential has publicly, you know, shared their strategy of customer obsession. We are, as I said, an old older company, and we have been organized around the business unit level. And that means a lot of our data is organized around the business unit level. But because we want to really work more fully with our customers, uh, the, our enterprise data governance function is a very important part of that. Um, you know, we really need to be able to bring together our data so that we can, we can, um, be more responsive to customer needs so that we can know our customers better and the like. And as I said, we will we are involved with um, sort of the hardcore compliance and security pieces of data management, but those are already well under control and and um, we contribute to that, but we really want to kind of move the needle with um, our ability to interact with our customers. I love it. It's a great uh, a story for, especially for a 150-year-old company, right? Uh, dealing with a lot of legacy systems and a lot of, you, you to to move the needle and, and to take it beyond and to grow the business is just amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's a very exciting time to be there, and uh, you know because the the challenges are there, but you can also see uh, how the work itself contributes directly to the business uh, opportunities and the business strategy. That's amazing. So stepping back here a little bit, Laura. So when you um, were just a child, a very young child, <laughs> did you dream like, when I grow up, I'm going to be the VP of Data Governance and Quality at Prudential? As a matter of fact, Shannon, I did not. <laughs> Although so what I was do... you wanted to be? <laughs> well, I I had several uh, several dreams. I I my first um, desire was to write plays and oh, wow. stories. So yeah. um, I used to write little plays when I was in uh, in elementary school. I remember in third grade, my first play was a Christmas play. Um, and then I wrote a mystery play called The House on Mulberry Street. I don't know where I came up with the name, but there wasn't a Mulberry Street near me. But that was that was what I like to do. Um, and then later I thought that I would uh, be probably become a lawyer, um, you know, when I was applying to college uh, and, and thinking through those parts of it. My intention was to go into law and I chose my um, college based on that. and. Uh, and then I got, um, so I was an English and history major, and I, I got so into um, my, my English degree that I, at that point, thought, oh, I'll go to graduate school and, uh, and, and try to also be a novelist, you know. So I went on and, um, and got a PhD in English, uh, English oh. literature, although, truth be told, my dissertation was 
probably should have been written in a history department, <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> and uh, so my, you know, at, by, at the time that I finished that up, of course, I was anticipating that I would have an academic life and, uh, and be teaching college. Um, uh, but at that point, it was somewhat difficult actually to get a teaching position in the humanities and uh, and through a series, and my my husband at that point had already gotten married, and I had uh, my first child had been born, and I was thinking about the world in slightly different terms, like economic terms. <laughs> and uh, through a series of very fortunate events, uh, my husband, who also was uh, a PhD in English. He, la he landed a job as an editor of a magazine in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we ended up moving there. And that began my corporate journey, but it didn't quite get me to data. Um, I, I took a position as a public relations specialist in a manufacturing firm. And uh, I, I, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, after you had contacted me and I thought, you know, what, what are the things, you know, that I've done that have to do with data or have contributed to my journey, you know, and, um, and to step back, I put myself through college, I was a bank teller. And so that wasn't directly data, but they did hire me because I knew how, how to use a computer which meant I knew what a keyboard was <laughs> and I knew what numbers were, <laughs> you know, um, but that it, it, I realize now, wow, that did have a lot to do with data quality. You know, we balanced every day at the end of the day and we, and, and I was in charge of keeping track of the money in the safe and the uh, number of travelers checks we wrote and all of these things that, you know, were um, the combination of data and money. <laughs> um, so anyway, when we moved to Milwaukee, I ended up um, in this public relations role. And one of the things that um, that they wanted uh, us to do, what me to do was um, write for the internet, which the internet was fairly new, but I also that that meant I was working with the IT guys in the company. And I was completely fascinated by what they did. Like I, I didn't know anything about how programming worked. I knew data entry, but, but that was the start of just this connection with the technical side of things. Mm. Um, and then when I left that job, I ended up in another corporate communications ro type role. And uh, I ended up um, wor again, working with the IT team and the company I worked for was an insurance company. They sold workers' compensation insurance. And their, uh, their business model was um, that they sold a very high-end product and they sold to customers who had a, a very bad uh, claim experience, right? So the cu customers where they had a lot of injuries, whether, you know, um, frequent injuries or severe injuries. And they would work with these customers using the claim data as the basis for a set of improvements uh, to reduce accidents, reduce injuries. And so that was my, my first real exposure to a business um, using its own customers' data to help its customers. And of course, I didn't know it at the time, you know, who knew? what would happen with data, but um, it, it had, that job was really formative for me because it had the combination of real use of data that had a very meaningful effects on people's lives and on the success of organizations and an improvement cycle. So they base their, um, their uh, reduction of claim ratios on uh, sort of Six Sigma type principles and total quality management type principles. And so I had this in introduction to both of those things at the same time. And, and that really piqued my, my interest in data. Um, so it wasn't until after that, that job ended that I um, 
well, yeah, as part of that job, <laughs> the the uh, one of the IT managers who was responsible actually for developing applications that shared that data via the internet, like a customer could log on and see their own claim experience data and see recommendations and the like. Um, I ended up working with that IT manager because I was supposed to, again, write copy for that. And uh, he hired me to manage the people who were developing those applications. So that was, at that point, I suddenly was actually in IT. The product that I, I that my team was responsible for producing was a data product. And um, I started like thinking about data very differently. I started thinking about it quite deeply. You know, how do you how do you do this well? <laughs> how do you uh, how do you use it as a communications tool um, and such? So that was that was what I would say was the beginning. And then, um, unfortunately, that company was purchased, and then nine eleven happened, and um, the the company that purchased it basically ceased operations in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up at United Health Group, um, and that was really the turning point. the The job that I took there was as a data quality manager. It was early two thousands to two thousand and three. And they had a second generation data warehouse and they wanted to make sure that they could report on data quality. So they brought me in. I, when I think about it now, I'm like, wow, I had no experience in data quality. I had some, <laughs> but nobody really <laughs> had experience in data quality management sure. then. You know, there was yeah. a, lot of, a lot of conversation um, there were some very smart people who were beginning to to talk the talk. So you had, you know, Tom Redman had already published his um, first two books focused on data quality, and David Lotion had published on data quality, and of course Larry English. So we, it, you had this beginning of a, a true foundation, and then um, the MIT uh, team was working on data quality as well, and and they started to have, they were having conferences and. Uh, and seminars and such at that point. So they were starting to, to launch. Um, so I kind of entered the field of data quality management at an optimal time. There was enough of a foundation. So I really had a lot to learn and I had the means to learn it. And then there was still a lot of opportunity and the landscape as you well know was you know, already changing. Um, you know, the capacity to, uh, collect data, the capacity to process data, that was all really speeding up at that point. So that meant that I could learn that as much as I could <laughs> and start to apply it. And, and so that's what I did. So I did not dream of it as a child, but I got you know to that point um, through, yeah. as I said, a series of fortunate events. I love it. You know, one of the reasons that I started this podcast and chose this topic, because there's no straight path to being in data, right? Like there's so there many isn't. different journeys. <laughs> um, and I think that's uh, the first time I've heard a PhD in English <laughs> to data, which is yeah. fascinating. I love it. But I'm guessing that passion, though, as a child for storytelling still plays a big role in what you do today. Yeah, it does, because you have to be able to communicate well with people. You know, a, a lot of people, well, first of all, there's a group of people that love data, as you know, <laughs> and are fascinated by it. But those aren't yeah. really the people that you need to convince. They're they're kind of the choir, you know. Um, yeah. And I mean, I... I I found out that I was one of those people. I love the way numbers work. I love seeing patterns in data. I'm fascinated by what we collect data about and what, you know, and how how we go about that. So there there are lots of people that are very interested, but the vast majority of of people um, are often intimidated by data or by technology, and they can kind of mix and match the two. So you have to be able to communicate with them. And part of that, obviously, storytelling skills come into play 
as part of that and um, being able to make good decisions about how to simplify data, like um, so that people can understand it, you know, give them a, a, a door in or a window in so they can understand data. Because I think that once you have that experience of seeing pat a pattern or understanding something better because you have the data to back it up, I think most people actually find that very exciting and interesting. And, and they realize you don't need to know everything. You don't have to be a statistician to work with data, that kind of thing. But you, if you can understand what the data represents and you can learn something through it, I, I think that most people find that really exciting and interesting. So you have to help them, <laughs> have to help them get there. I love it. And, and so, and, and I mentioned in the beginning, you are considered one of the leading experts in data quality and definitely that path explains how you got to be um, considered that. And you've literally written um, a couple of books on it. Yeah, I've written I've written two books directly on data quality, and and I've been um, part of my passion has been how do you measure and make uh, the quality of data understandable. Um, so the is called uh, measuring data quality for ongoing improvement, and I from the title you can probably guess <laughs> that um, I took very seriously the role of measurement within the improvement cycle. So if you you know if you can figure out what are the things that are important about the data that make it of higher quality, and how do you represent them so people can understand when the data is of low quality or of better quality. Um, if you can kind of crack that nut, then um, you can make the decisions you need to make about where to apply resources for improvement. So when I, in writing that book, I actually worked with a team of, of people um, that included um, a, a enterprise architect, a developer, a representative of the, of our business team and a person from data governance. And we were trying to launch a data governance program and people were saying things about data quality that were, I thought, somewhat naive. And I still hear these things today, like, oh, you know, either you can't measure it or it's, or it's all about, you know, how many, what percentage of nulls you have or whatever. There's not, you know, there, there was nothing in between. Um, you know that <laughs> those two extremes of it's impossible or or here's all these statistics that I can give you and you know do something with them or don't do something with them or thinking they're going to speak for themselves so we really wanted in that book we really wanted to think through a framework for how to think about measurement um and then in the second book which just came out uh in early 2022 um it's a very different sort of book in some ways because I really, I, I, I've been in this now for close to 20 years and I feel like there's been an evolution in data quality management, but it hasn't actually been to the good. <laughs> um, I, you know, um, so what do I mean by that? When I, um, when I started in data quality management, there was uh, a lot of discipline around data quality management that came directly from uh, manufacturing and service quality models. So when Rich Wang uh, talked about total quality management and Larry English talked about total data quality management, they were really drawing on that well of um, quality management for manufacturing and the services. Same thing with Tom Redman, right? The three, Rich Wang, Rich Wang Tom Redman, and Larry English. They are rooted in that, in that, in that history and in those methodologies, um, and that's what I learned. <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of data quality management now has has been it's become an adjunct of data governance, and and data governance people in general are not rooted in that in in that set of methodologies, and. There's not been the sort of real, in my, in my way of thinking, the real discipline around 
how you think through data quality problems. So I think it's I, I think it's done a kind of disservice to data quality management. So in this second book, part of what I wanted to the questions I wanted to answer were, well, why why has that happened? <laughs> what's gotten in the way of the path that seemed to be laid out and how do we make it better right how do we get on track and how do we apply more discipline because i i also really think that we need both governance which sets policy and standards and um and uh tries to really change behavior and uh quality management, which applies standards and um, and takes very seriously how we measure things, um, but also wants to change behavior. You know, there's a lot of a lot of intersections there. So the second book is is a, a kind of wider exploration of those questions. Um, and how do we you know, how do we handle not just um, the technology part of data quality management, which we have to be in the we have to be in the right relationship to technology that creates, manages, stores, and provides access to data. But we also need to account for people and process in a in a much more disciplined way. We can't let those things go. Um, and then we have to account for the fact that what we're working with is data, um, you know, and and that's different <laughs> from a, a physical product. It's different from a, even a service because uh, you know you can reuse it, you can use it multiple times. It's it, there's so many characteristics of data that make it slightly different from other resources. So the second book it kind of takes this wider span of um, of ideas and tries to just rethink them. I love it. Uh, it's so timely, I think, um, from based on what I've seen in, in how data quality is coming to the forefront again. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's definitely, I think people are revisiting, they revisit quality <laughs> because <laughs> as they see more yeah. data. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want I don't want people to forget that we have a we have a history of yeah. doing this. You know, there a lot of people if they're new to the field or if they're not aware of all the thought work that's gone on, they can um, they can assume they're the only ones that have these problems. And and uh, you know, so part of what I'm I'm trying to present is like there are a lot of problems that people that organizations have all already addressed or that there are methodologies to address. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. So tell me, Laura, um, what is then your definition of data? So not surprisingly, given my background <laughs> in, <laughs> in literature, um, I always talk to folks about data as a, a representation of reality. So it is a means through which we represent people, objects, events. And, and when we think about it in that context, um, you, I, or I like to think about it in that context because it allows me to talk about the kinds of choices people make when they represent anything. You know, so if you think about a painting as a representation of reality, right? There's no question that the painting is separate from reality. It isn't, it isn't the reality it depicts. People sometimes forget that about data. And it's also very clear that an artist makes choices about uh, what to include in the frame, uh, how, what the palette is, what details to include and exclude. Those kinds of choices are made when we, when we create data. Um, and so when you start to think of it that way, then when the question of quality uh, can be can be framed in relation to the choices that people have made about how to represent an, an event or um, a, you know, a person or an object. Um, and I realize that a, a, 
that is a little bit abstract, um, but you think about it, right? If you are collecting, let's say you're collecting data about people and and you, let's say you run a, a, a store that sells athletic equipment, <laughs> right? You're gonna want information about people like their names and their ages and their, um, it, you know, where they live, all of those sorts of demographic uh, characteristics that any um, business is gonna wanna know about their customers but you're also gonna wanna know things like what sports they play, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, what their shoe size might be, <laughs> right? I mean, that's more important in some ways than some of the other clothing choices that, that you might make, right? Um, you definitely want want to know if you can, you know, what organizations are they affiliated with? You know, is this, is this eight-year-old who walks in, you know, a, a baseball player or soccer player player you know is he in little league is she you know uh on a travel team whatever those are things you might want to know whereas if you own a different kind of store let's say a bookstore you're going to want to know other characteristics of people you know um what are their what are their hobbies what are their interests you know if you if you see people who buy a lot of cookbooks that's kind of one group of people if you see people who buy a lot of poetry that's another group of people so yes, you want names and ages and zip codes and all of that, but you're thinking about your customers in two different ways if you're selling those different products, right? So those are, those are choices that um, you have, when you're setting up your systems to collect data, you make different choices and that can affect the quality of the data as well. So I, that's why I like to think of it as that representation and a set of choices in terms of what we represent. Makes total sense. And I and I love the abstract comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I do. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launch pad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. So, um, so then do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? So, I, I see it increasing and I've, I've, I've had a, a mixture of reactions to some of the changes that we're going through. Um, so I'll step back from the question just a moment and and, and say, um, so, you know, I told you that I, I worked at a bank, right? Yeah. And I told you that I worked for a manufacturer. And in both of those positions, I realized I, I had a lot of things that I did working with data that, you know, we're just part of my daily work. <laughs> um, nobody called me a data manager, but a lot of what I did at the bank was manage data. You know, how much money do we have? How much actual cash do we have in the in the safe? How many people um, went into their safe deposit box today? You know, those kinds of things. And I was recording data mainly manually, um, but it was part of daily life. And I know, you know, in the in the companies that I've worked for, which has been mainly insurance since I went corporate, um, the, many people in insurance companies are creating data or using data, that's their job. Um, so I feel like at one level, there, there is a really strong need to recognize that people are creating and using data in their regular jobs. And, be, and as doing that, there's a level of managing of that data. They, they have to engage in data management at, at least in their daily jobs. And I think we kind of miss that, that part. Um, that said, there's also all of these changes in technology and how we collect and use data and, and the uses of data have really exploded. Right. So when I think about the work that data scientists do, for example, one of, you know, one of the big obstacles to getting data science work done is that 
data is disparate in, in an organization, or I, I would even say, I would, I would prefer to say heterogeneous, right? Because it's not like people are separating the data, but different people are creating data in different ways. And so you have very heterogeneous data and, and the data scientists want to be able to use that data quickly and, and um, you know, effectively. So you've got more data products than you previous, previously had. So there is definitely a need for um, that middle ground where people's job is really managing the data itself, you know, ensuring that there are standards defined and that people can follow those standards and, and uh, create data that is less heterogeneous um, so that the people that are using it have fewer obstacles that they have to um, get around in order to use the data. And I feel like that's really where all of our data management skills and, you know, when we think about professional data management, that we need we need to really um, hone those skills and recognize changes at both ends of the process, right? Of the folks that are data creators, uh, data producers, they need to be aware that way over in the data science area and the analytics and BI, that there are people that need the data that they're creating, that it's not just to get the transaction finished, it's to really understand the business and to understand the customers and to make uh, better choices that will help both be successful. So I feel like there's definitely, I in that sense, I definitely see the the need for um, an increase in the number of data managers. But I, I want us also as a profession to be more aware of the everyday life part of data. <laughs> you know, like I'm doing my job and I'm creating data. And then all of this opportunity um, with, within analytics those folks, we, they're in a sense, the real customers of data management because the inputs are gonna be produced regardless because you know you, you need to sell products or process claims or um, any of the activities that, of running a business. But if that data management middle position can be more successful, then you not only get your claims processed, you also, learn more about your customers at the end and you can help influence them and help serve them better. So yeah, I think there's I, I think there's a lot of opportunity and I and I hope that results in in more jobs. And I also hope it results in like us becoming, I don't know the word. Um, <laughs> I keep saying disciplined. I you know I really do feel like there you have data management provides a lens into an organization. So you have to be able to see the big picture of the organization, but you also need to be able to home in on details that could go wrong. <laughs> and you, yeah. you know, so that's what I, that's kind of what I like about it. <laughs> so, so what advice would you have for those looking to get into a career in data management? Maybe it's specifically into uh, becoming a data quality specialist. Yeah, so from the data quality perspective, I have I, I have lots of thoughts. You know, um, so data literacy, the concept of data literacy is is becoming something of a buzzword now, but I and I, and that it's unfortunate that it's a buzzword, but it is fortunate that people are talking about it because I really do think that there that that one of the most important things for anybody working with data is to understand uh, what the language of data is. Uh, and and a lot of the language of data is also the language of data management. So I would say if you are going into, either data quality management or data governance, learn that language of data management and understand um, understand data in an organization in a holistic way. I've been, I've been trying for years <laughs> to come up with a good metaphor 
for for data within the organization. Um, you know, we've, we talk about the lifeblood, we talk about data as the new oil, you know, both of those are help a bit. They help people understand the role that data plays. What I, my, what I've been saying um, in, in my books and also in um, just when I've talked with people is, you know, data binds the organization together. It, it allows different parts of the organization to connect with each other. So plays that role of, of connector. And so if you can look at your organization and see those connections, um, then that is a really good way to think about the problems you need to solve in quality and the problems you need to solve in data management generally and in governance. You know, like, okay, if these connections aren't happening the way that they should, then those are the places where you need to work. So getting that picture of your organization through its data is one thing that I would strongly, strongly recommend. The other thing is it's, Ultimately, so much of what we do is about how people behave. <laughs> and so uh, having, the, having a perspective on people and how they interact with processes and technology is so important. Um, when I started this, I was so excited about the data itself and the patterns and just the way that it worked and how much of it there was. I didn't pay much attention to the people part. Um, and in recent years, I've really been giving much more thought to that. Like, wow, you know, I'd come away, I'd, I'd, I'd talk to people or, you know, I'd give a talk and I'd get a question and I'd think to myself, wow, Laura, you left a big part out. This person doesn't understand you because you left a, a big part out that you assumed everybody knew, but they, but they don't, you know, so, I think paying attention to the people part is just incredibly important. Like people will make the changes that they need to make to make data better. And if we, we ignore that at our peril, um, as Tom Redman would say, um, you know, at your peril. <laughs> so. That's great advice, Laura. Um, and, and you know, in addition to your books, are there any additional resources for to help learn that language of data management? Yeah, so obviously you guys at Dataversity have just been super with uh, the kinds of educational programs that you've put together and the, you know, the really vast scope of that. I, I'm always impressed and, um, and really happy, <laughs> really happy that you guys are there. Um, there's also uh, DEMA itself, so the Data Management Association. And um, I, I didn't mention this earlier, I probably should have when you were asking about the books, but I, I was the production editor on the DM Bach 2. And that was incredibly beneficial to me as a data management professional because I got, um, I really had to think deeply, not only about data quality management, but about all the other knowledge areas within data management. So I'm a strong um, I'm a strong proponent of of learning uh, through the DM Bach and also using that as a as a starting point to go more deeply into other areas, particularly um, with data quality management because there are a lot of really good uh, books on data quality management and they're they're aimed at um, at different problems that you can solve within that. Um, as a as a um, an introduction to the to the DM Bach, I also published a book called Navigating the Labyrinth, which is um, at the time the president of DEMA jokingly referred to it as the Cliff Notes of um, the DM Bach, and it is kind of that's what it's it's meant to be. But it also the intention is also to help people within data management communicate uh, up the ladder. So. Uh, it's an executive guide. So that's a good resource. Um, the One of the books that, that I would recommend for people starting on data quality management is Danette, is specifically Danette McGilvery's book uh, on, um, on uh, the 10 steps, because she, again, takes those, um, takes that quality management methodology and makes it very real, very concrete for 
uh, whether you're doing a very small project or whether you're doing a larger project, she gives you the tools and templates that can really get you started. So there's a there are a lot of just really, really good books out there. Um, so I would go to the bibliography of the Dambach as well to to tap into that expertise. Uh, and the Dambach is a massive book. It's great resource. And just for anybody who doesn't know, it stands for the Data Management Body of Knowledge. Correct. And it indeed is that. <laughs> and you said mentioned it's on 2.0, the second edition of of that book. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Love it. Well, Laura, so, and where can people find the DM Bach and your books? Are they all on Amazon, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. So they are available on Amazon. And um, I, a lot of DEMA chapters actually will have a discount um, that they can help people with if you order direct from the publisher on the DM Bach. So. And to find DEMA chapters, they can go to DEMA.org, DEMA International. That's Yep, Dama International. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> well, Laura, this has been so great. I didn't, I, there's so many things that I'm learning about people. And uh, uh, I love your start as a storyteller. I think that is just phenomenal. Clearly, it's uh, an evolution that has, has gone far for you in your role with data. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the, taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, you are most welcome. Thanks for inviting me, Shannon. So appreciate it. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.